Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Russ Thomas, and I'm the CEO of the Prostate Forum of Orange County. It is our pleasure tonight to bring to you one of the highly regarded speakers that we provide for your information pleasure the fourth Thursday of every month. Tonight I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Stephen Williams. He's the Chief of Department of Urology, Urologic Oncology in Kaiser Perman Permanente Riverside Medical Center in Riverside. If you could hold your questions during the presentation until he is finished, then we'll give you a chance to ask your questions after Dr. Williams has finished his presentation. Tonight, Dr. Williams will speak on the current role of robotic prostatectomy in the treatment of prostate cancer. He will discuss a high-level description of procedures and minimum requirements to qualify for surgery, i.e. Gleason score, PSA, staging, etc. He will talk about recurrence at five and 10 year periods, side effects, risks, and recovery period. Dr. Williams focuses on urologic oncology, cancers of the urinary tract. His specialty is surgical treatment of urological cancers such as prostate, bladder, testicular, or kidney cancer, and as a radiation oncologist specialist, he works closely with radiation oncology and medical oncology to provide a multidisciplinary approach to treatment. As such, his practice embraces, his, embraces surgical and non-surgical treatments, such as radiation, hormone therapy, and chemotherapy to determine what treatment or combination of treatments might best serve the individual patient. You will see, as I go on, his education, academic appointments, licensure, other appointments, current regional and professional committees, clinical trials, presentations, abstracts, and papers presented, and publications are way too numerous to mention in this short introduction. So I'll give you just a short demo. <laughs> you can see why I didn't read them all out. Um, his current research interests entail the role of lymphodenectomy in robotic, robotic radical prostatectomy, frequency and quality during the learning curve. Number two, testosterone-based uh, LHRH dosing in men with prostate cancer. Number three, salvage cryotherapy for recurrent prostate cancer, efficiency and quality of life. Oh, I'm sorry, efficacy and quality of life. <laughs> Number four, practice patterns for use of intravesical therapy for superficial bladder cancer. And long-term follow-up of radical cystectomy. As a side note, he was born and raised in Philadelphia and his heart is with the Philadelphia sports teams and remains a diehard Eagles, Phillies, Flyers, and 76ers fans with great pleasure that the Prostate Forum presents Dr. Williams. Wow, what an introduction. I wonder where you get that Philadelphia information. It's completely accurate. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. That's one, good one. Um, Russ, thank you very much for having us. Uh, and it's always an honor to um, speak at any of these support groups, as I've done for many years. Um, the, I want to thank Mr. Larry Barman, who I've known for many years and was on 
gone through uh, many trials and tribulations with him, and uh, I, he was uh, sorry he couldn't make it here tonight. But um, uh, it's uh, he kind of got me going at this and, and suggested some topics and thought it might be good to focus on this. Um, and so while it is a very large topic to cover, I'm going to try and pare it down. We'll, we'll cover some of the, the more critical things and. Um, and then hopefully be able to uh, answer any, any questions you have at the end. And um, yeah, so the, my background is a urologic oncologist, so that's someone who has done specialty training in, in surgical treatment of urologic cancers. Um, but as Russ pointed out, the, the treatment of all urologic cancers, including prostate cancer, which is by far the most common, uh, is a multidisciplinary approach. So I work very closely with our radiation Specialists. I work very closely with our medical oncologists who are responsible for chemotherapy and using medicines to treat prostate cancer, Lupron being, being one of them. Um, and uh, so uh, I work very closely with, uh, with people all around the region uh, for uh, Kaiser Permanente for many years. And so um, the, the, my surgical career has really spanned the era from open surgery uh, when I first started in the 90s. Um, through residency and fellowship, uh, through laparoscopic surgery, which was uh, for prostate cancer, a very short window, thankfully, and uh, onto robotic surgery, uh, which is certainly how the majority of prostate surgery is done in this country, 99%, and about 75% of every cancer surgery I do, I do robotically now. So that's been a pretty big change in the last um, eight years or so. Um, so I kind of want to uh, give you some information from my experiences over close to 20 years of, of um, take care of patients with a variety of uh, cancers and many, many with prostate cancer. Show a little bit of data and information without getting too bogged down in it um, because uh, it can get very confusing even to the, the best prostate cancer experts. So um, the, I, I always like to, if we're talking anything, any at all about treatment for prostate cancer, I like to open with this um, because really the first pre question should always be if once you're diagnosed is um, is treatment necessary? Uh, we used to think years ago, you have, everyone has to have treatment for prostate cancer. We now know that is not the case by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and uh, we know that all men will get prostate cancer if they live long enough into their 90s. Uh, the majority of men who get prostate cancer will have a more of a slow growing, less aggressive cancer, okay? Um, and we know, uh, based on a lot of statistics, that if you are diagnosed with prostate cancer, the chances of, of surviving living on your life are the 97, 98% in up range. And so, uh, we really want to try and figure out who needs treatment. And tonight, of course, we're going to focus specifically on, on radical prostatectomy. But um, the treatment always comes down to the risk factors for any individual patient. That's based on your PSA blood test based on your Gleason score, which is what the pathology, when you have your biopsy, that information is, um, the biopsies are looked at under the microscope by a specialist who will give it a specific score and figure out how uh, aggressive or unaggressive the cancer may be. We look at the amount of cancer in those uh, biopsies and then we look at clinical stage, whether there's been any, any chance of spread. Um, and that sometimes is, is done through x-rays, but certainly not always in prostate cancer. But, here are the two things that are really important when we talk about treatment. A man's age and his overall health. Because we know prostate cancer is extremely slow growing, years and years and 20, 30 years. So um, if many men who are diagnosed in their 70s, probably most are not gonna need any treatment. If you're diagnosed in your 50s, probably ought to really think about treatment because uh, over a 20, 30 year period of, of uh, further living, you could, it could be affected. Um, so, uh, there are lots of treatment options, and I'm sure you guys have had talks on many of these over the years. Um, we, we always start with surveillance, you know, is the patient a candidate for active surveillance? And then we look on the, if not, then we talk about therapies of curative intent. So we want to try and cure the cancer if we think it's dangerous enough. Um, I put cryotherapy up there, and I, I've done many, many cases of that, not for initial prostate cancer, but for recurrences after radiation which is, I think, really the only indication uh, for it um, in, in, in current day. So um, that's not, surgery and radiation are really at the top of the list in terms of been around, been uh, proven, been perfected. 
Um, and so, uh, of course, hormonal therapy and other medical therapies are now uh, certainly things we use for trying to slow down the cancer or if it's spread. But as many of you probably know, there's a ton of information that comes uh, when you try to understand prostate cancer. And so, um, I think the most important thing at the very top it says risk stratification, but, but the real learning lesson here is know your risk group if you've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, okay? We, we, the, the, the correct way to evaluate prostate cancer is based on a patient's risk group. There's a low risk, there's an intermediate risk, and there's a high risk, and those refer to the risk that the cancer may have spread, okay? The low risk group is generally categorized throughout the world um, uh, based on a PSA that is less than 10, a, a biopsy that shows a Gleason score of 6, and in, in some studies have shown Gleason 7, which is a, a, a 3 and a 4, two numbers put together, indicates a, less, a slightly less aggressive form of 7. And again, here, this is a, this is a oops. Sorry about that. I was trying to... Uh, And so the low risk group is basically an unaggressive cancer and a, and a low amount of, uh, of cancer in the biopsy. Yeah. So it has to be three cores or less of cancer. And that's, there are some variations in this throughout the world in different studies, but that's generally the ones accepted. And, and the staging when you see T1C or T2A, it's a clinical stage based on the doctor's rectal exam or digital exam of the prostate. You know, you can't feel any cancer, you don't feel any spots, and that's a T1C, and that's most men nowadays. Or you might feel a little tiny spot, hard spot, that could indicate cancer, that would be a T2A. So we're talking about all these different parameters indicate a very early stage prostate cancer that has a very low chance of spreading, okay, over a 20, 30 year period. The next group, uh, group risk group is called intermediate risk, and that's where things start to rev up a little bit. PSA is a little bit higher, above 10, but less than 20. Now you're talking about Gleason 7, uh, which can be any combination of how these cells look under the microscope, um, and uh, like more than three cores of cancer. So now we're starting to see more cancer in the prostate, and now we're starting to feel, uh, and it could be any one of these, a little more hard area on the prostate on exam. And then the highest risk group is, is of course, the ones we really worry about, because if you have a high PSA above 20, where you have a Gleason score under the microscope, the cells are very uh, aggressive, eight, nine, or 10. Um, those are, are cancers that can be quite dangerous and, and have a much higher chance of spread. But knowing your risk group is really the first place to start when you're trying to decide on, on a form of treatment. And then once you know the risk group, you can ask that question, okay, am I a candidate for active surveillance, okay? Many, many men are nowadays, because many men come in in this low risk group. There's even this, this very low risk group um, that uh, really when you talk about just having one spot of cancer in, in, as opposed to two or three, but anyone in this lower risk group really is a candidate for active surveillance, okay? Um, the, uh, the other things you have to consider, same idea, right? If you're going to go on active surveillance, your age, your health, your anxiety level, these are things I talk about with, with patients every day. The younger you are, the longer you have to follow the cancer, uh, that, that can be a little tough on, on a patient and his family. Um, their anxiety level starts to go up year after year, so if you're trying to follow the cancer for 20, 30 years, that sometimes starts to impact uh, patients and their decisions. So you really want to include all these things when trying to decide on that. But, but once you've figured out whether because you're in that intermediate risk group or higher risk group and you need treatment or should have treatment, or whether you decide you don't want to go on surveillance for any of these other reasons, you know, that's when, when we look into the therapies of trying to cure the cancer. So tonight, we're, we're kind of focused on the, the radical prostatectomy. And, and without going into it, because we could talk for days and days on which of these treatments is better and, and whatnot, and, and it's a very individualized approach for every patient. The one type of treatment may be better than, than another. But pretty much every study to date that has looked at surgery versus radiation has shown they're very equivalent treatments for each risk group of prostate cancer. There's some data out there, I'll show a little bit of it, that looks like when you start talking about 
15, 20 years down the road, the, the outcomes from surgery might be a little bit better. But in general, we, um, any, any person who is treating patients with prostate cancer, whether it be a radiation specialist or a surgical specialist like myself, um, there, there should be no question that, that the treatments are equivalent when you, when you look 10 years down the road, okay? So, one, the main thing of that uh, we want to talk about is when should surgery be considered for patients with prostate cancer, okay? And there are some pretty clear areas where I, I absolutely uh, would try and recommend surgery over radiation to patients. Um, and that really comes down to just a, a few things. A younger age, okay, the younger you are, the more years you have potentially to live, um, the higher your risk of prostate cancer will, of coming back, that will be a much higher risk if the prostate stays in the body. So radiation can kill all the cancer that is there, but 15, 20 years, you might have actually a new prostate cancer developing. Now, unfortunately, it does not happen very much, but, but that accounts for some of the, the differences in outcomes when we start looking many years down the road. Um, you should definitely be in good health if you're gonna undergo surgery. Uh, even robotic surgery, while it's relatively easy on the body, you still have to go to sleep under general anesthesia for, for two to three hours. Um, and so if you have any significant heart disease, history of stroke, things like that, you will be at higher risk of suffering more of that if you go under general anesthesia. So generally better health, better candidate for surgery. And, and at the bottom, I'm trying to see, was there a laser pointer on here? Yeah. On the side? On the top. Oh, yeah, there we go, thank you. <laughs> So this is, I think, a big factor, and I, I talk about this a lot with, with my patients. When the staging of the cancer, when it's important to know exactly how much cancer we're dealing with, that's when surgery can be very helpful. Uh, by removing the prostate surgically and then removing lymph node tissue around the prostate, uh, we can then analyze every millimeter of the prostate, every millimeter of lymph node to know exactly how much cancer is there and if it has started to spread. We can't get that information any other way. There's, MRIs aren't good enough. Um, and so there's just no imaging in the way. So if, you, if pathologic staging is very important to help determine what's coming down the road, uh, that's where surgery plays a big role. This is important if you have a lot of cancer on your biopsy, six, seven, eight, nine cores of cancer. Uh, if there is a Gleason score of eight, nine, 10, where there's concern about the spread of the cancer out to the lymph nodes, this is where surgery can play a, a very important role. So, um, while there's not, I would be lying to you if I said surgery is 100% better than radiation all the time, it's not. But there are times where it, it does have some advantages. Um, so, I'm going to go into s some detail about the surgery, show some pictures, particularly with robotic surgery. Um, and uh, I, I had some videos on here and I couldn't get them to play right, so I apologize. But as many of you probably know, you can go on YouTube and look up robotic prostatectomy and watch, you know, 20 videos. Uh, so, um, so, but I'll, I'll show some pictures that I, I pulled from the, from the video. But the, the reason I, I show this, what appears to be a very complex slide of the bladder, the prostate just in front of the bladder, and then the urethra, which this would be out here, and then the rectum, which sits just underneath the prostate. So the, the legs would be coming down here and the head would be up here. Um, Prostate sits in a very precarious position, close to a lot of important organs and a lot of nerves and blood vessels. Um, and so it makes, that's what makes it a very complicated organ to treat, much more difficult than, than many other types of uh, uh, cancers. Um, I show this slide because for years when we were going through the era of open surgery, where I would make, and I did a surgery for many years, make a, a, a cut below the belly button and use my hands to, to the prostate to do everything. That's how we did lots, all surgeries for many years. When, when the robotic surgery started coming around, we, there were all these arguments, well, we have five or six little incisions and they add up to 2.5 inches and this open incision is three or four inches, so which one is really better? Maybe, you know, uh, and what, what turned out that none of that really made that much of a difference because um, what really mattered were the outcomes from the surgery and it's very difficult to get outcomes from prostate cancer surgery because it takes 15, 20, 20 years, you know, it's a very slow growing cancer. So ultimately what happened is robotic surgery won out, as we all know, uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. It's, it's 
how radical prostatectomy to treat prostate cancer is done robotically more than 99% of the time in this country. The early studies just had to prove that it appeared to be an equal way of doing surgery. And subsequently, the evidence more in recent years has shown that robotic surgery is better than the traditional surgery in a few ways. Uh, there's less bleeding, uh, there's a shorter stay in the hospital, and there's a quicker recovery. These things are proven better. There's nothing else about robotic prostatectomy that's been proven better than the old way we did the surgery, but they are equivalent. So all things being equal, if you can cure the cancer the same and preserve nerves the same, but have less bleeding, get out of the hospital quicker, and feel better at one week after surgery, two weeks, this is the way to go, all right? But it took time to get that data. Um, ultimately, what, what happened is there was a very good marketing by um, Da Vinci, for the Da Vinci robot by Intuitive. Patients really sparked a big interest and were asking their doctors about it. Um, and so, uh, way back in 99 uh, is when the first robots started going in. There, there really weren't many of them uh, back then. And then, and through about a five year period, a bunch popped up. You can see West Coast, East Coast, mostly major cities. Uh, and then, just from 2003 to 2007, there was a huge explosion of, of uh, robots being in installed throughout different medical centers throughout the, this country. And the United States was by far leading the way. Europe and Canada took many, many years before they adopted the, um, the robot. There, uh, prob there, there are many advantages to the robot, but I think the most important one is that the robotic instrument moves just like the human hand. And so, Robotic surgery is actually much more similar to open surgery and how I did surgery for many years using my hands because the instruments move the exact same way. Um, the old laparoscopic surgery, these are very static instruments that can only go up and down and side to side and they didn't move like the human hand. So laparoscopic surgery really fell by the wayside quite quickly when the robot came into play, at least as far as some of the cancer surgeries I do. Um, and the other key aspect for the robot is we can the surgeon can sit at the console and, and look into this console and see everything in three dimensions as if I was doing open surgery where I can see in three dimensions as opposed to looking on a screen and everything's in two dimensions. Obviously you want everything to be as precise as possible when you're doing surgery in a very delicate area. And so, so some really key aspects that made it uh, very doable and, and this is just an example of several of the robotic instruments, needle drivers we call these with a normal suture um, holding things so it's a, it, those are actual size. Um, so everything's quite delicate. They, the robotic instruments are um, about uh, six millimeters, so about a quarter of an inch. Uh, if I go back to these uh, the incisions, um, each one of these little incisions we make is about eight millimeters, so a little bigger than a quarter of an inch, and then you put a little, little uh, what we call a port, and the robotic instrument goes through that um, so, uh, we're talking about very small incisions in, in which allows for quicker recovery. Okay. So, this is an example of our first robotic operating room at Kaiser West Los Angeles when we started the program in 2008. Uh, and I, I show this just from the standpoint of this is where the, the patient would, be, would go to sleep and lay down during surgery. The robot comes in from the feet and the head would be up here. And then we're looking now from, from where if someone was lying down, the feet would be here and the head up here. And then the console, the surgeon sits right there. is in direct communication with an assistant who actually is scrubbed into the case and changing instruments and things like that. Um, so once the, the patient is asleep, we put the head down a little bit. The, the goal there is to uh, allow all the intestines and everything to float away from the bot from the bladder. So we don't have to worry about trying to move things out of the way. Gravity does the, does the job. Um, and, and then we uh, bring the robot in from the feet. And there are four robotic arms that control the camera that allows the surgeon to see, and then three instruments. So it's actually, I get to operate with three arms instead of two. So, so that's a, a one advantage over open surgery for sure. Um, and then this is uh, my assistant uh, docking and, and the robotic arms onto this little, to the instruments, so that the, uh, which then I will control through the console. So, the, I can give you some, some interesting numbers based on our experience since 2008 when we started our robotic surgery program. We purposely came late to the robotic game because we had to, we wanted to be convinced 
as uh, cancer surgeons that robotic surgery was really a good way to go. So there are people who were doing surgery since 2002, 2003, but it really took time before the data was there to say this is something that we think will be safe for the patient and will be better for the patient. Um, so since 2008, we've done over 7,000 robotic radical prostatectomies throughout our 12 medical centers in Southern California. We now have, we started with 10 of us doing the initial surgeries. Now we have 30 fellowship trained robotic surgeons. So these are all urologists who have done extra training in robotic surgery or in cancer surgery like myself. Um, the, the, this is all direct information that, that we've, we've kept. So the average time for, for the surgery is, is about uh, um, a little over two hours, two hours and 20 minutes. To, uh, if you're doing lymph node removal, that takes extra time closer to three hours. If you don't have to remove lymph nodes because it may be a less aggressive cancer, we're not as worried about spread, it's closer to a two-hour operation. Most patients go home the next afternoon after surgery and you go home with the catheter, as, as people may know from reading or have had the surgery. Uh, we, on average, our patients have the catheter for about seven, a little over seven days, and we remove that in the clinic when they come back to the clinic. Um, the key aspects of surgery Absolutely, number one, we want to remove all the cancer, right? That's the goal of surgery. You want to avoid a positive margin. That's if the cancer is growing out to the edge. You need to make sure we get additional tissue removed beyond that edge so that all the cancer is removed. And we also want to remove any lymph nodes that drain the prostate in case cancer is spreading to that. That is not necessary for all patients. That intermediate risk, higher risk group, we are at higher risk of spread. That's where the lymph node removal is very important. Okay, but so it's not done all the time. And then the second key aspect is we really want to preserve quality of life. So you want to get rid of the cancer and you want to preserve quality of life. We're, we're very good at getting rid of all the cancer as surgeons. We are not as good at preserving quality of life exactly the way it was before surgery. And that really is because it's a, there's a lot of nerves in the area and no matter how perfectly surgery can go, things just don't always recover the way we want. So this is kind of a, a, a schematic where the surgeon sitting at the console, these instruments come from, from the direction of the head, looking down to the legs, looking straight onto the bladder and the prostate. Um, and, and this is, kind of shows the initial surgeon's view as we remove the prostate from the bladder. That's kind of the first step. Um, this is a, a, kind of a schematic, so not a real picture, but the prostate has, was attached to the bladder here and has been removed. And this shows again both the surgeon preserving the, the nerves that run along the backside of the prostate and go out to the urethra and to the penis for erections. So, um, in most men, I will, rec I will try to preserve or will preserve nerves responsible for sexual function. The only reason not to is if you're in a higher risk group, more cancer, higher chance of spread. The cancer is spreading through the prostate, or we think it is. You can see how close the nerves are. We do not want to preserve nerves in that scenario, otherwise we leave cancer behind. And we're not accomplishing the main goal. But most of the time, it is, it is, we're able to preserve nerves. Um, this is an example of, of showing a picture of the prostate here being kind of pulled over to the left and the nerves and blood vessels being preserved. And this is a real picture of the prostate with the nerves being uh, actually, we, we kind of pull the prostate off the nerves so the nerves aren't are really uh, moved at all. And part of the reason why it's really hard to get all men to get to be 100% back to normal after surgery, even with pre preserving the nerves, this is a great uh, picture of showing where the, what the nerves look like in and around the prostate. So they've removed the bladder. The bladder would sit here. This is the prostate just in front of it and then the urethra out here, these nerves would come off the spine a little higher up and come down and up and around the back side of the prostate. So it's not just one nerve on each side we're trying to preserve. It's a very delicate web of nerves, some of which go to the prostate, and those nerves have to be cut and removed. Um, many, most of which would go on past the prostate onto the, the, uh, the penis to allow for erections. But it's a very delicate web, and so you have to be delicate in all areas of the operation to preserve those. Um, and this, uh, this may not show up very well now, I see it from here, but this is a prostate that has been removed. 
The nerves in bundles, what we call the nerve bundles, are preserved on each side. The bladder is actually right here, which we don't see too well. And this is the urethra. So the final step of the surgery is the bladder moves down and then we uh, sew it to the urethra so everything's connected and you can urinate normally again. Um, and this kind of shows it in a, in a schematic view. And this is, this is a real picture of bringing the bladder down and, and sewing it to the urethra so everything has been reconnected and, and you can urinate normally again um, one week after the surgery, seven, eight days. So again, we talked a little bit about this. Um, uh, most patients go home the next day after surgery, come back a week later and get the catheter out. And most patients uh, were really back to work or if they're not working normal activity within two to six weeks. So if you're at a desk, you can get back to work at a desk pretty quickly within a couple weeks after surgery. Um, if you're doing more physical labor, it's kind of closer to six to eight weeks. So it really depends um, what kind of work you do. But it's a very quick recovery. Um, the, unfortunately, what, what it says up here is recovery preserving urinary function and sexual function. Right? Those are the two key things we want to try and do to preserve quality of life. Um, and we pretty, it's pretty predictable as far as the urinary control goes, right? Takes about two to four months, gradual return of urine control, 100, virtually 100%, 98% of men who have prostate surgery. The first week or two, for sure, they're gonna be leaking urine when they stand up or when you cough or sneeze. Um, the, the, and the reason is because that area of the bladder that was removed, where the prostate connects, uh, that, that's a sphincter mechanism that kind of keeps the urine in. We don't even have to think about it. It happens automatically. That area is a little bit disrupted. It's also stunned and doesn't work right away. So um, you do not have perfect control of urine when you uh, first have the catheter removed a week later. And it's a gradual process of wearing a diaper because there's a lot of leakage to wearing pads only, less leakage, single pad and no pad. And the goal after surgery is Somewhere down the road, two months, three months, four months, you should not be wearing pads. That's the goal we shoot for every single time. It does not happen 100% of the time, but we're, we're up there in the, in the 90, 95% range by six months. But that absolutely should be the goal if you're gonna have surgery, that you should be out of pads um, uh, by six months, okay? The sexual function, erection issue is a little, much different story. It's a much longer recovery process for those nerves to recover, okay? And very important that if you want to maintain that and get that back after surgery, go through some aggressive rehabilitation. Um, I put all my patients on, on medication similar to Viagra, starting very early on after surgery to help with uh, some evidence that that uh, kind of stimulates the nerves and gets them coming back. We also have things like vacuum pump and injections, lots of things, ways to kind of help with the real rehabilitation of sexual function. That's a very important part after surgery. Um, so um, I put just a couple slides up here about what are the outcomes after surgery? Because there is a very high level uh, research done for many, many years, thousands and thousands of papers on this. What are, the, what are the outcomes after surgery? But what we really want to know is what the patient wants to know, am I cured of the cancer, right? And if I'm not cured, what are the chances that the cancer could come back, okay, in my lifetime? And then, the quality of life outcomes, we really want to get back to normal urinary control, normal urination, no leakage, and recover normal sexual function, whatever that is where you were going into surgery. You're not gonna be better than you were going into surgery. Our goal is to get you back to where you were, very close to where you were before surgery. Um, so when we talk about, am I cured of my prostate cancer? We, we look at things in a variety of ways. Um, what we know is that the PSA should be zero after surgery if all the cancer was removed, okay? And that, that is reported on most lab tests as less than 0.1, kind of confusing. It means we cannot find any PSA in your bloodstream. So um, that's what we're looking for. Um, and when we look at results of surgery done, you know, thousands of patients done throughout the world, we kind of speak in terms of, okay, the patient is free of cancer, their PSA is zero. We speak of there's been a recurrence of PSA, what's called a biochemical recurrence, means you feel fine, no sign of any cancer on any x-rays, but your PSA number is no longer zero. It's showing up as a zero, uh, anything above a 0 0.2. So these are very tiny levels, but usually tells us after surgery that cancer may be coming back. 
And then, and then many studies look at, of course, that are meant nine for prostate cancer. Um, so on that rate, it's important to note that, uh, that the average amount of time that men live after prostate surgery, regardless of, and this is across the board, half of men live, to, live beyond 14 years, okay? Um, so even in cases where the cancer may be coming back, men still live a very, very long time. Um, so without getting into too much detail on these graphs, th there are some very interesting studies. This study looked at men who had their surgery or had radiation from 1994 to 1995, one year. There was about 1,200 men who had surgery at, from this cohort of um, what we call a SEER data group coming from major cities throughout the country has been followed, followed men in the treatment of a variety of diseases for 30 years. Um, so about 1,100 men had surgery and about uh, 500 men had radiation. And they looked at how long men lived after their treatment. The top, this top graph is men who had radiation and the bottom graph is the men who had surgery. But they followed men out to 15 years and they're still following. And by 15 years, about 60% of men had passed away from all causes, not necessarily prostate cancer, but in fact, most of the time, many other um, things, such as heart disease. That's by far the most serious health risk in this country is heart disease and heart attack. Um, and then the next graph shows, they looked at the men who, were, who had passed away from specifically because the prostate cancer had spread. You can see those numbers are way down here, 5% five, 5 with surgery, a little up to 15 or 20%. You can see for men who had radiation, the longer you live, the higher the chance the cancer is going to come back. It's not a big difference. We're talking about about five or six percent of men versus uh, about 18 percent of radiation. So it's still, is. but that's the one where where radiation and surgery differ a little bit. If you're going to be living out beyond 15 years, so that's going to be younger men um, or healthier men. There's a higher chance the cancer comes back after radiation. Um, and so now, all those men who had that surgery was open radical prostate surgery, uh, going back to 94, so 22 years ago, all right, 21 years ago. We know we're a lot better at surgery than we were 21 years ago. And there's even some evidence that the robotic surgery is improving how we do surgery. That hasn't been proven yet, but, but uh, we're gonna see that's the case. So this is the robotic surgery era from Dr. Menon almost 1,400 patients who had robotic surgery in the early 2000s. And you can see virtually every man is alive five years later after robotic surgery. So very rare to, 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 to die from prostate cancer after surgery in the early going. Um, what it does show here as you get further out, right, men start to have a little bit of their PSA show up. So about 20% of the time after surgery, even after robotic surgery, and this is true across the board, any type of surgery, that uh, we're starting to see a PSA bump up. That doesn't mean you feel fine, you're, you're able to live your normal life, but we're starting to see a little bump in the PSA. So it's about 20% of the time for all men after having surgery. So 80% of the time, PSA is zero, seven, eight, 10, 15 years down the road, okay? Um, so a really important thing to uh, remember that just because your PSA may be going up after you've had surgery or radiation, if it's been two years ago or five years ago, uh, it doesn't mean you're gonna die from prostate cancer. In fact, you, you may most likely live a very normal life after that. Um, probably the, to keep it very simple with regards to the side effects of surgery, all right? All men are gonna have temporary effects. We talked about the leakage. All men are gonna have some leakage for a period of time. Um, it's very difficult to assess those effects um, and compare groups. Uh, requires very uh, strict research and validated questionnaires, things like that. Um, some men are happy to fill out their questionnaires before surgery, maybe a little bit after surgery, maybe not a year later, maybe not two years later. So we don't always get great, great data. It's very hard to do. But the bottom line is, we know after surgery, urination is going to get a little bit worse because you're going to have leakage, and then it's gradually going to get better, usually in the, within the six month range. Okay. The sexual function, the erections are going to get worse for a longer period of time and then gradually get better, but doesn't always get back to normal. And so this is kind of the area where, where there's a definite side effect from surgery, okay? Um, 
A lot of graphs here. I'm not going to go into too much detail. This is those men who had that, their radical prostatectomy, 94 to 95, those 1,100 men. Um, and what way back then we saw that this is this is whether they were uh, how much they were leaking. And of course, after surgery, everyone leaks, but they didn't quite get back up to where where they started in terms of their urine control. A variety of reasons. We weren't surgery wasn't as good back then. The questionnaires they used back then were not as accurate either. Um, and, and then we see an even bigger drop off with the erections. They, they, they're obviously not very good in the beginning and they slowly come back, but don't get all the way back up here. Um, what, unfortunately, this doesn't uh, um, project as well, for, particularly if you're in the back, but this was a, a really interesting study. This is probably the best study that we've seen yet. This is a, a, a clinical trial done in Great Britain, in England, looking at uh, about almost 2,000 men who at the time they were diagnosed with prostate cancer, a, a computer-generated program said you're gonna either have surgery or radiation or you gotta go on active surveillance. So you, you had to fit the criteria. So they used those risk groups, but the men were randomized. Now, we could not do that in this country. And when they talked about it at our meetings, they were presenting this from the, the, the docs from England, said all the power to you, but we couldn't do it in the United States. But but they did it there, and it's actually quite interesting. Um, and everything was done under strict guidelines. And you know, if, if a patient didn't fit the criteria for surveillance, and they were on to have surgery or surgery radiation, but um, well, they actually use very strict questionnaires that we know are very accurate for monitoring quality of life. They gave them to the patients before they had treatment. They gave them to the patients after they had treatment. Virtually every man filled out all the questionnaires over a five-year period. Um, and what they found is. Interestingly, we know that, that this is the, the urinary score, whether they were, how bad their urination was, mostly related to leakage, and it dropped off in the first six months, then it almost came all the way back to normal, about 90 to 95% of normal within, with, by five years. So this is a more realistic of what you can expect after um, surgery, uh, assuming you're seeing someone who really has a great deal of experience doing surgery. And then they also looked at sexual function and they looked at this is kind of the, the, the best thing and, and what we know is that this is 100%, this is men who are 100% normal to begin with and there's not, not many men in their 50s or 60s or 70s that are 100% normal to begin with when we talk about erections. Uh, most men are about the 60% and there's a big drop off and there was some improvement over six years but it never got back to where they were to start with, okay? So, so that, the erections are, are, when you talk about quality of life, those are things that can definitely be affected and may not get back to normal after surgery. So, a lot of information, I try not, I hope it wasn't too much, but uh, uh, the bottom line is when we talk about why someone should have radical prostatectomy, in this case robotic prostatectomy, um, after a diagnosis of, of cancer, uh, there are a couple things that are important, right? when it's important to cure the cancer. So that means you're gonna be in a, in a medium or uh, intermediate or high risk group, okay? A higher chance that that cancer is gonna, um, gonna spread. That, that's important to try and get rid of the cancer if you can. Typically, monk, men that are younger in better health fare better with radical prostatectomy. And when that staging is important, we're really worried about spread and we wanna know exactly what's happening with the cancer, that's, that's when surgery can be really, really helpful, okay? And I think real important to remember I tell patients you can ex expect to get back to normal in terms of urination um, and not having to wear pads about 95% of the time, okay? Um, and, and the goal is no pads, but, but I've done all, over a thousand of these surgeries and on average I have about this 5% of men that will still need to wear a pad after six months. And they may not leak a lot, um, but they, they're leak enough to wear a pad. So it's, we, we're not 100% perfect on that, but we're, we're close. And the sexual function is a lot less likely to get back to where you were beforehand. So, so this is something that um, you have to be aware of. Younger men in their 50s, early 50s, mid 50s, usually get back pretty close to normal as we, the age is a big factor. So we get into our 60s, 70s, much harder to get the sexual function back to normal. So it's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, so those are kind of the key points. You, got, you probably already know a lot about all the different websites and things that are available um, and that I think are, are quite, have quite accurate information on, on them. So um, I think that's it. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to answer any, any questions that you guys have.
If you have any questions, please raise your hand. I'll bring you the mic. Uh, yes, Randy. Good evening, Doctor. I have a couple, couple questions for you. Uh, first of all, how often, how often uh, is there some benign tissue left uh, in the prostate bed or in that area after surgery that could result in a small amount of PSA reading afterwards? And then the second question I have on your screen is you noted that anything below 0.1 would be considered zero for PSA. Correct, correct. Okay, and and, and, and uh, is there a reason why there would still be a PSA of less than 0.1 after you've had a prostatectomy other than having cancer? Correct, very good questions. So first question, is it possible to leave benign prostate tissue behind? It is possible, ideally it should never happen because the goal is to remove the entire prostate, the cancer, the normal tissue, um, the reason we remove the entire prostate is cancer typically occurs in multiple areas of the prostate. It rarely is in one place. So if you just try to remove part of the prostate, you'd probably leave cancer behind. So we always remove the entire prostate. Um, it is possible to leave benign tissue. It rarely, rarely happens. I mean, an experienced surgeon, it should be a, a very rare event. When it does happen, what, what happens is maybe a year or two years later, we see a PSA of 0.1, maybe not quite to 0.2, but it stays at point 0.1. It doesn't keep going up. If, if there's cancer that has either escaped the prostate before you got to it surgically, um, or for radiation that matter, the PSA will show up at some point in the future. It might take a few years, it might take five years, but the PSA will be point 0.1, but then it'll be point 0.2, then it'll be 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and it's just gonna keep going up. And that, that's when we know for sure it's, it's cancer coming back. Yeah. Then the other question I had was, was anything Point one or below is considered zero PSA, correct? Yeah, well, less than point one. So the, the, the way that the, the test most commonly used in this country, they report it as less than zero point one. Um, there are tests available in this country that measure zero point zero zero one. They're called super sensitive. For, for normal clinical aspects, it's, it's useless. It doesn't really help us that much. But uh, there was some law they said, well, they can't say zero because we have this other test that really um, so, yeah, so it's less than 0 0.1 uh, is how it should be, would mean no PSA detected in the bloodstream, yeah. Let me throw something in that uh, addresses that same question. Randy and one of our other members in our discussion group both have PSAs after radical prostatectomy of 0.2. Mm -hmm. When they were 0 0.02? Was it 0 0.02? Okay, 0 0.02. I think somebody else bill was a point two, I'm not sure. Point two, yeah. That's so, point still small two numbers, two but that's two. Now, their concern was at a point two that indicates some reoccurrence of prostate cancer after surgery. Yeah. What do they do at that point? <laughs> right. So technically if it's point two or higher, we consider that a recurrence of cancer after surgery. Radiation uses different numbers. Um, and first thing we look at is the pathologic stage. So what was the stage based on looking under the microscope at the prostate and let know if they were removed. Um, if that shows that there's a high chance that cancer may have escaped the prostate, we see the cancer growing out to the edge, positive margin, through the edge, stage three cancer grows through the edge of the prostate. We say, okay, there's a high chance that we're seeing cancer cells starting to grow in that area. And you, then we would use radiation to treat those cancer cells at a very, very effectively use radiation. It's a much shorter course of radiation than if you had radiation as a primary treatment. Um, and it has a very high success rate if there's a lot of evidence saying that the cancer escaped through the edge just to the surrounding area, but it didn't go any further. We're not perfect at figuring that out. Um, that's where lymph node tissue comes into play. If you remove lymph nodes at the time and they're all negative, you're, you'd say, okay, can cancer's probably right in that area. We'll treat that with radiation. I have three questions. They all relate to the same thing, getting an image of my prostate cancer. Okay. So the first is, does Kaiser have multi-parametric MRI? Second question is, can Kaiser give me an image of my prostate cancer from anyway? And then you mentioned clinical stage. Yes. 
which meant any sign, and you've also talked about it going out maybe to other areas, to the lift nodes and so on. So what can Kaiser do for me after having prostate cancer for 10 years and only have been on Castlemix? Uh, so no surgery, no radiation, and right. none of that. Yeah, so figuring out where prostate cancer is, if you've had treatment of some kind, PSA may be a little bit uh, low, but not zero, is a very difficult proposition. There are no good tests to date if we're trying to find out if the cancer has spread uh, with a very low PSA. Now, if your PSA is 20 or 30 or 40, things like a bone scan and CAT scan can often show where the cancer is. But if your PSA is below 25, we have very little ability to find out where it is. Um, so there's a millions, if not billions of dollars of research over the last 20 years trying to find ways to image where prostate cancer could be um, after someone's had treatment and their PSA is maybe three or four or five, maybe it's going up very slowly. Um, but nothing yet that, that works anywhere in the world, all experimental. When we're talking about imaging of the prostate, okay, we, we do have very good uh, ways to image the prostate. MRI of the prostate is the best way to do that. Um, most men do not need imaging of their prostate. I'll tell you right off the bat. Um, we do not use multi-parametric, uh, what we call what, what, three Tesla. Um, uh, that's kind of the, the, the newer ones, but we, uh, the older MRIs, when I talk older, like a year or two, uh, are equally good at uh, imaging the prostate without having it. Now, What's really best for imaging in prostate is an endorectal coil where the patient has to have a tube put up the rear end of the rectum and, and very uncomfortable and, and if the slightest movement and, and we start to lose images. So um, we do not use that. Very few places to use the endorectal coil, but that's the best way to image the, the, the prostate on MRI. Um, with, with the current, so we could, have, wherever you are, you could have your the prostate image. Um, the reason to do an MRI of the prostate is prior to having any treatment, okay, so you haven't had radiation, you haven't had surgery, and either you've had a biopsy and it's negative, we couldn't find any cancer, but your PSA keeps going higher. Sometimes the MRI is good at finding uh, small areas of cancer that weren't picked up on a biopsy. Or you had a biopsy, you showed one little spot, you're on active surveillance, you've been watching the cancer for three years and your PSA was three and four, and now it jumped to six and then an eight and nine and we're gonna re-image the prostate before deciding whether maybe to go on to treatment or go on to another biopsy. Yeah, so it's your situation a little bit unique. Um, there may or may not be a reason to image the MRI. It would really depend on the necessity of doing a prostate biopsy and finding cancer in there, or if you were considering having surgery. That might be a reason to, to, to image it. Well, my PSA jumped from six to nine. My Gleason score was seven originally 10 years ago. Right. Yeah, so six to nine is not a big jump. Now, if it happened over a three month period and three months later went from nine to 12, three months later went from 12 to 15, I'd be a little concerned. But six to nine by itself, whether it be over a shorter time or a longer time, not, not as big a concern. Um, really depends if the PSA, because PSAs will, be, and many of you may know this, if you had any treatment, it will bounce around up and down. Um, whether uh, you sometimes if the prostate's been still there, particularly after radiation, we can see bounces too. But um, yeah, so. So uh, how going up by a point or two or three is not always a big concern. It really depends on where you are in the whole treatment regimen. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> Doctor, a uh, couple of questions. Now. You mentioned uh, um, that during the prostate technique, yes, yes, right, right. Uh, sometimes you notice. Uh, the intent is to preserve the nerves. Correct. But then you notice, you may notice cancer around the nerves. Correct. And then you have to remove Potentially those. remove some of the nerves. Some of the nerves. Yeah. Um, would radiation avoid that issue? So, very good question. Very good question. What you couldn't see on those graphs I showed comparing radiation and surgery in terms of preserving sexual function um, is that the initially you can preserve some of the erectile function and erections with radiation better than surgery. But usually by about five years, those nerves did suffer some damage from the radiation because when they give radiation for the prostate, they are 
they, they program the radiation to go beyond the edge of the prostate because you want to get all the cancer. So if you just program the radiation to go to the edge of the prostate, you might miss cancer. So they program beyond the prostate, sometimes by a millimeter, they can program two millimeters, three millimeters. You start getting two and three millimeters off the prostate with radiation, those nerves are there, going to be, receive some radiation. So um, what, what we know is that initially after radiation, you can, those nerves are pretty well preserved. Starting about one to two to three years, those nerves start to be, the effect of the radiation is taking place. It's a delayed effect and the erections start to drop off. So that's pretty much guaranteed that radiation will affect the most. You're gonna, absolutely going to have some effect. Again, younger men uh, who don't have high blood pressure, don't have high cholesterol, don't have diabetes, have 10 out of 10 erections, will not have as, the erections may not be as affected nearly as much. Yeah. Uh, second question, you, I think you answered it a moment ago, but you know, sometimes I'm not sure what you heard. But, yeah. um, in other cancers, such as breast cancer, uh, in determining the stage, uh, they do a body scan, bone scan, etc. Yes. Like that. So, and then you said, well, maybe, okay, so then it's kind of tied to the first question. So you can't do that with uh, prostate cancer to determine if the nerves are involved or Correct, correct. So um, the indications to do any sort of scanning like that to check for spread is, is uh, a high-risk patient. PSA above 20, really it's 25 is, the, is the, the national guidelines, and at least an 8, 9, or 10. Those are really the only indications to get bone scans and CT scans and prostate cancer. In fact, uh, it would be you, could, you would be needlessly exposing a patient to radiation if you did a bone scan or CT scan with, with in an intermediate or low risk group. And that, that is absolutely recommended not to do that by the American Urologic Association, European Urologic Association, and worldwide. Um, the reason is those scans just aren't good enough to pick up very small areas of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is a very slow growing cancer, and PET scans and all those things rely on, on dyes that are taken up by fast growing cancers, so they light up on a scan. The prostate cancer just doesn't take up the dye well enough to be seen on any of those scans. Um, for nerves, MRI is getting better. We're still not great at being able to really see if the cancer is growing through the edge into the nerves. Um, and uh, some really good uh, research coming in, in MRI and that may be able to use where we could actually see where the nerves and where the cancer and where they, how close they are to each other. That's still probably three to five years away before it's reliable. I've got a question. It's not so much the cancer, but the robotic surgery. I have an ongoing, I haven't talked to him about it for a while now, a friend who's an attorney, so he's not a dumb guy. <laughs> and uh, he read sometime last year about, oh, there was some robotic surgery done over the internet or over some, you know, uh, secure uh, uh, link or something like that. And I said to him, Les, I says, uh, I know, that, you know, things have to be approved and so forth like that from the FDA and stuff, but is there any place that surgery, let's say with the United States or even around the world that is done robotically, let's even point it to the prostate, over an internet or some link like that? Uh, yes, so the military has done that for years. Oh, uh, surgery? Yeah, where, where uh, you can actually use, um, and robotic surgery can be controlled by a surgeon who may be miles away, um, okay. but because of the, the, the uh, internet access they can control. Now you have to have an assistant there at the bedside. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah you have to have someone there. You have to have anesthesia there at the bedside with the patient and all that stuff. But it can, it, it can be done. Um, so maybe he's right, but, but it's, yeah. Yeah, it's not really being done to any great degree, certainly yeah. not in the hospitals across the country. Most hospitals, we are, um, we're pretty much set up to do that if we, if we needed to in our system, but uh, realistically, um, we're, there haven't been a need to do that, but the military is where, where there potentially is, right? Because I saw where you saw some of these places, and even now, to this date, or whatever that thing was, the different centers in the Midwest up there in North yeah. Dakota and all that, you don't see any, we could have them set up up there and have the doctor. <laughs> that's exactly right, and, and that's what we're talking about. Yeah. It, and and it, 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 it uh, has been done, but more in experimental meaning. Um, it's not something that is set up to be done day after day after day. 
uh, requires uh, quite a bit of infrastructure and things like that. But uh, that's not too far away from being able to do that to help out rural, rural areas, yeah. right? You know, maybe in the middle of Montana or South Dakota where you don't have an experienced surgeon, um, you could have someone who's, who's even hundreds of miles away be doing the surgery as long as you had an assistant at the bedside right. capable yeah. of helping out. Nothing, no other doing. Oh yeah, so so of, of all the surgeries I do for, the question was 75% uh, uh, of, of uh, patients have surgery. Actually, what I should clarify, of all the sur cancer surgeries I do, which includes prostate, that's obviously a big part of it, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, um, the, about 75% of the surgeries I do robotically, the other 25% I do the quote unquote old fashioned way with an actual incision. Um, and that usually is more advanced cancers. That, that just, uh, you need a little more room to maneuver. There, you're inside the, when, when we do robotic surgery, I didn't go into too much detail, but through these little openings, we put carbon dioxide into the body uh, at a fairly high pressure to push the abdominal wall away and it allows us to see very well. Um, and uh, that, but you're still limited in the amount of room you have because the skin is closed. And so when you're dealing with uh, larger types of cancer, not necessarily prostate, but bladder cancer and some other things, um, that uh, you need more room to work and so you have to make the, the incision and do the surgery that way. Yeah. All right, I have some questions. Um, regarding the uh, CT imaging and the multi-parametric MRIs, how are those images gonna be affected by two hip replacements? Oh, good question. Um, not much at all. Not much at all. So, um, certainly not the CT scan. Um, really, bone scan, CT scan, if it were necessary for prostate cancer, not that it often is, but uh, would not be really affected at all by hip replacements. MRI. Two, two hip replacements. Two hips, yeah, yeah. MRI, a little higher chance that the images may not be as good, but uh, if you have a, a radiologist who is trained in MRI, they're able to protocol when you, before the patient goes through the MRI and adjust things a little bit so that um, the, you're able to see the prostate still very well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other was, I wasn't quite sure from your diagrams up there regarding my level, but low risk or medium risk. Uh, three years ago, I was a PSA at 3.8, and two months ago, it was 5.9. Okay. And seven months ago, my Gleason was a five course of three plus four. Okay. And, and kind of guess on a level, a risk level there. Yeah, so there are five cores of cancer that were found out of 12 or 14 or six, however many viruses there. Actually, six, one was three plus three. Yeah, six. So that puts you in that intermediate risk group from the number of cores, because you have more than three cores. Um, your PSA is still low, but any one, I, I should have specified a little better, any one of those factors will move you up a risk group. So if your PSA, is above 10 and you only had two cores of cancer, you're automatically in the intermediate risk group. If you have a PSA that's low, but you have five or six cores, you're in the intermediate risk group. Okay? So any one of those factors can, can move you up. And, and there are varying degrees of that. Um, so we, you know, you're, you, I would put you in a, with a low PSA, but five cores of cancer, three plus four and three plus three. You're kind of in a low to intermediate risk group. Right, um, and so uh, maybe depending on your age and your health, active surveillance would be something that we could talk about. Um, if you're, you know, at age 80, it may be not great health. I would say active surveillance for sure. No reason to have radiation surgery, but you know, so so it, we, there are stratifications within the risk groups as well. Yeah. Good question. Uh, actually, two questions. One, we had a presentation uh, here from uh, Dr. Erling of mm -hmm. UCI. Yes, yes, now, yes. He's done about 1,500 of these robots. Yeah, he's done very many, yeah. He seems to be an advocate of uh, not using electropotomy, yes. using a clamp. And he claimed that in the last 500 or so, he's having uh, very good results on erectile function, mm -hmm. uh, even with only one nerve spare. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of curious on your comments there. Uh, the other thing was, what's your feeling on the level of experience required? Uh, I think there are some studies that people who have doctors have done more than 400 robotic surgeries have somewhat better results. 
of course, it's hard to get experience if you can't right, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, first question was ways to improve the nerve sparing, right? Um, a lot of ideas have gone around. Dr. Ollering's been one of them who's, who's uh, looked at actually uh, cooling the nerves during surgery. And, and one of our one of my colleagues is a cancer surgeon over at Kaiser Los Angeles who I work with regularly. Um, he trained under Dr. Ollering and uh, helped do some of the research for that. Um, it looks like it probably helps, but it's very difficult to deliver cooling at an even temperature along all the nerve bundles during a two to three hour surgery. So, that, so the, the utility of it actually is quite difficult, although it probably would improve things. Um, and and um, mo pretty much any experienced robotic surgeon will tell you, you want to avoid using heat cautery, which controls bleeding, on the nerve bundles. So we always try and avoid using cautery on the nerve bundles, if at all possible. Um, and we try to avoid pushing on the nerve bundles. So there's something called traction injury, which is, I believe is real, although it hasn't really been proven um, to any great degree, but uh, if you pull on the nerves and you stretch nerves, they're not gonna work as well afterwards. They may eventually work, but it might take time. So um, we really try and, as I showed in some of those pictures, bring the prostate up away from the nerves and not pry the nerves away from the prostate. So we really try and minimal pushing or moving of the nerves is very important. Um, the second question was about how many prostate surgeries were yeah, experienced. So it's been uh, a great debate for many years in urology, going back to the days of open radical prostatectomy, where um, some really interesting research um, coming out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, one of the great cancer centers in the world out of New York City. Um, and in the open prostatectomy era, they showed that uh, one of the great open prostatectomy surgeons, Dr. Peter Scardino, who um, still practices in New York City, um, should, their data showed a, a minimum of 250 open prostatectomies was necessary to kind of reach a, a level that would be considered expert. But when they went on to, to follow their, their surgeons who had done more than a thousand, there was even continued improvement in outcomes, mostly in terms of cancer control, um, up to a thousand. Beyond that, not much. We do not have data quite that good in, in robotic prostatectomy. Um, I will tell you from having done, done over 650 open prostatectomies and now done uh, almost 400 of the robotic prostatectomies, um, it, this number's gonna be pretty similar. You probably need to be up in the, uh, above 250 to 300 robotic prostatectomies before you're reaching a level of, um, of excellence. Now, that would be someone coming fresh out of fellowship training. You know, someone who's done hundreds of the surgeries before, as I did open surgery, it doesn't take quite that long to get expert at robotic. It's a much quicker learning curve. Um, and uh, so, but you're, you want to be in a, be seeing someone who's done, you know, number one, has had specialty training in, in surgery, in robotic surgery. And that can be as a cancer fellowship like I did, or it can be in robotic surgery fellowship. And ideally, up above 250, 300 of the surgeries, yeah. You just ask a surgeon how many he's done? Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things that you want to know. You want does the surgeon have fellowship training, specialty training in, in cancer surgery? Um, for prostate cancer, there are many people who do prostate cancer surgery, robotic prostate who did not train as a cancer surgeon like I did, but train as a robotic surgeon. Um, and, and I think that's fine for, for prostate cancer. You know, they've, so they have specialty training in robotic surgery or cancer surgery. Um, and, uh, and then you ask them how many have done? Yeah. Now, the hard part is, it's gonna be hard to get an exact answer. I will tell you, most surgeons may not know exactly how much they've done and they might not tell you exactly the right number. Um, and uh, the in very few centers in this country keep exact data. We have exact data. We, we, can, we know exactly how many prostate each, each of the 30 surgeons has done. Um, we did not have that data beforehand. I kept my own data prior to that for the open surgery, but uh, we have a pretty extensive uh, electronic medical database in Kaiser, so we, we've got a lot of uh, information there, yeah. It's not uh, available to the patient? Uh, some of it is, yeah. We publish some of that and, and put it in our brochures for the patients, yeah. Um, and some of it, not yet, some of it still has to go through 
uh, kind of research ends and, and looking at statistics and stuff like that. So, yeah. Couple more questions, Doctor. Uh, when you're doing a robotic surgery and your patient has stage three uh, cancer, your, your patient has stage three cancer. Can you see the cancer while you're doing the surgery, okay. and can can you adapt to that? So, did anyone hear that question? So, okay. Um, the shorter answer is no, most of the time you can't see surgery. If I'm seeing, uh, you can't see cancer. If I'm seeing cancer during the surgery, it's bad cancer. And, and I virtually always know about it ahead of time based on um, what the patient was diagnosed with, based on MRIs, based on CT scans, based on a digital exam, a physical exam. You know that it's a bad cancer. Um, so, uh, but the microscopic stuff that cancer just barely growing through the edge, we cannot see. So we, we try and be as accurate as possible ahead of time to figure that out. Uh, that's where MRI, the question you have about MRI, can we see the cancer through? It's not good enough yet, even the best, uh, newest technology is not, not quite ready to, for us to be able to see the cancer. And I had uh, robotic surgery myself, and the doctor took uh, just one lymph node, and that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was clear. Okay. Okay. But is that an indication the other lymph nodes would be clear as well? Or why would the doctor only take one and not take two? Uh, not sure. I mean, the, there are indications to do lymph node removal. That usually is if you're in that intermediate risk group, at least in seven, PSA above 10, or, or, or worse. That's really the indication. So there, there's not absolutely necessary to do a lymph node removal if you're in the low risk group. Um, there's pretty good evidence, uh, mostly coming out of Europe, that if you're going to do a lymph node removal and get accurate information from it, uh, it needs to be a fairly extensive lymph node removal. I will tell you there are not many surgeons outside of cancer surgeons in this country who know how to do extended lymph node dissections. Um, they, 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 we don't really have the data as good in the United States, and that's why some surgeons don't believe it, but I, I absolutely believe it based on European data. Um, and you're talking usually in the range of 15 to 25 to 30 lymph nodes removed if you're doing an extended lymph node dissection for prostate cancer. But that is not necessary unless you're in that higher risk, you know, intermediate to high risk group. Yeah. Because the risk of spread is, is so low from a low risk uh, group. So. Are there uh, um, after effects of that? So, yeah, so are there, are there any effects from doing lymph node removal? Um, there are, unfortunately, very uncommon. Um, so for about uh, 90, in our data, we've started to look at this um, between, the, there's three surgeons, uh, two other besides me that do extended lymph node removal for, for uh, most of our for patients that are needed. Um, somewhere in the range of uh, 95 to 97 percent of patients, no effect, okay? Somewhere in three to five percent uh, will have swelling, temporary swelling of one leg or the other. That goes away usually within three months. Um, in uh, let, well less than one percent um, uh, of patients will see swelling that persists, and that's usually due to a blood clot that forms as a result of the, the, the swelling curled up in around the prostate and it blocks some of the blood flow from the leg and cause what we call a DVT or blood clot in the leg. Um, so that's, that's very uncommon. Um, and then the other thing that occurs one or two percent of the time is you get a, a fluid collection um, and we see it on a CT scan, maybe someone has swelling that's lasting longer than normal and it's not getting better and we have to put a little drain in it and it's usually done with our interventional radiologist, a simple 20 minute procedure, drain the fluid out and, and then within a couple days all the fluid's drained and, and you're done. So there are side effects, relatively very minor. Thankfully, from uh, but again, it's uh, uh, it's one of those things that I, I certainly always talk to patients about ahead of time. Wow, what a question and answer session! Yeah, good, had very tonight. good questions. <laughs> okay, doctor, thank you very very much for a good presentation. When we have Dr. Howard here, you know that you're competing against the best, and I think you did an excellent <laughs> job. I know we can't pay you because we don't have that much money, but your time is money, right? So we're going to give you I'm some time. You know why? <laughs> we're going to give you some time. There's a coffee oh, yeah. across oh, that great. Room. You great. can stick it in your car so you don't have to sit home at breakfast time and drink your coffee. <laughs> you can you. drink it on the way to work. And it's, uh, oh, yeah. It's emblazoned with prostate for orange kind. That's fantastic. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Williams. Yeah, very good. <laughs>
Thank you for watching our video. If you would like to learn all the most current prostate cancer information, we have many YouTube videos on our website at www.prostateforum.org. We also have meetings the fourth Thursday of every month where you can talk to mutual survivors. You can also ask personal questions to the doctors and the speakers after the meeting. Remember, when us men hear the word cancer, the big C, our brains turn to mush. We think we're about to die. Come learn where there's hope and information at the Prostate Forum of Orange County.